Good evening. My name is Kyle Volk. I'm the chair of the history department here at the University of Montana. And on behalf of my colleagues, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Swanberg Lecture in Military History. If I'm not mistaken, and Arnold, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the ninth year that we're holding this event. It should really be our 10th annual event, but unfortunately, COVID intervened last year and kept us out of the uh, lecture hall. But we're very excited to be back this year in person doing the Swanberg Lecture in Military History. I'd first like to thank my colleagues for their heroic organizational work. John Eglin and Mike Mayer did a great job organizing this event. Thanks to you both. Appreciate it. I'd also like to thank MCAT for recording tonight's presentation. Um, we're able to hold this lecture because of the generosity of a University of Montana alum, Arnold Swanberg. I'd like to recognize Arnold this evening because it's ultimately his passion for history and military history in particular that has enlivened our campus and really brought us all here tonight. Um, just a bit about Arnold. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in history from UM in 1970, and he did what so many University of Montana history majors do. He went on to a thriving career in which he, no doubt, used many of the broad liberal arts skills that he learned in our classes um, to manage a series of successful businesses. Uh, Arnold is, as I've said in this setting before, he is something of a Renaissance man. He's a writer, he's a publisher, and he's a collector. He has authored a 60,000 word novel. Um, he is also the former publisher of Flightline Magazine, a magazine devoted to the history of North American military aviation after World War II. Arnold lives in Seattle, and it's our honor and pleasure to have him here tonight. And I'd like to ask Mr. Swanberg to stand, and I'd like to ask all of you to join me in thanking him for his generosity in making this lecture happen. It's also my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, the historian and writer, Alan Taylor. Dr. Taylor is currently the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation professor at the University of Virginia. He is, without a doubt, one of my favorite historians of early America and the American founding. And I don't think it goes too far to say that he is perhaps one of the best and most important historians of his generation. Uh, I never had the pleasure of meeting Professor Taylor in person before this afternoon, but I actually got to know him a bit uh, some 20 years ago in the cold Chicago winter in the year 2000. I was in my first year of graduate school, and anyone who's being honest about the first year of graduate school will tell you it's often a difficult year, and it was for me. And in the second semester, I enrolled in a course on US political history, a reading seminar, and after our first class meeting that year, I was kind of doubting my choices. The first week, we, we read some, some really impenetrable history of party politics in the 19th century. Uh, it was a dense book. It was driven by quantitative methods, filled with charts and graphs, and there were no people. There were no stories. And I, I really remember thinking at this moment, is this what academic history has become? Is, is this what academic history is like? And Alan Taylor proved that it was not. Uh, the next week, we read his wonderful microhistory, William Cooper's Town. That's a book, I think it was published in 1996, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it tells the, the story of the rise and fall of a man named William Cooper, uh, the father of the famous writer James Fenimore Cooper. Um, it tells William Cooper's story, um, and it's about, it's about his life in the age of the American Revolution. Um, the book was certainly character driven, it was lively, um, but it was also something more. I mean, Williams Cooper t Cooper's Town is a book It vividly used the lives of actual Americans to make sense of what the transition from monarchy to a republic to a democracy meant for regular people and regular people living in very local contexts. It was really a masterpiece and it earned Professor Taylor 
my lifelong adoration, but more importantly to him, it earned him the Pulitzer Prize. Um, the first of two uh, that he has won in his storied career, um, and that, of course, is an amazing achievement. He's authored eight other books, several of which have won major awards, and virtually all of them have in some way shaped, often in significant ways, how professional historians, students, and oftentimes the wider public think about early America and the American founding. His talk tonight is drawn from his most recent book, American Republics, A Continental History of the United States, 1783 to 1850, and that was published this past May by W.W. W. Norton. Um, I couldn't be more excited to hear what he will tell us about the war uh, of the 1810s. We're lucky, very lucky, to have Professor Taylor here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Kyle. Um, can you all hear me? Have, have I turned on the right switch? Okay, that's good. Uh, I'm getting to the age, that was a very kind and, and, and great introduction, but I'm getting to the age, I almost, I, I worry what people are gonna say about me when they get up to start. Um, because there, I've, I've met so many people and, uh, and included tonight at dinner, Jack said to me, well, we've met at these two times in the past, I didn't recall. Uh, probably the most uh, stunning is, in, is uh, Jonathan Earle, who's a very fine historian of 19th century America, came up to me one time and he said, we've actually met before. You changed my life in a bathroom at the Library Company of Philadelphia. And I said, well, well, well hold on there. I, I need an explanation for this. It turns out we, we just had an innocent conversation in there. And uh, he was doing his dissertation, and he wanted to uh, work on the anti-rent wars in New York. And I said, well, there's this guy, Reeve Houston, who's working on that and is about to publish a book. So he, Jonathan Earl went and did a different project. OK, you'll be relieved to know that I'll do my actual presentation now. Uh, I want to thank um, Kyle and Michael and John and, and Tate for uh, very kindly um, arranging this and hosting my visit. Uh, I am grateful to Arnold Swarnberg for his support for this particular lecture. Um, and I, I want to thank all of you because it's an act of courage to come out uh, to a talk in which you may hear about the War of 1812. Uh, it, it's a contender with the Smoot-Hawley tariff for the most boring topic in American history. And I just want you to know that the doors have been closed to this building. Uh, so, I think part of the problem is the name, which actually doesn't help most Americans to know when the war was fought. And it certainly doesn't help to know when the war ended. It's with pretty good reason that books about the War of 1812 have subtitles like The War of 1812, A Forgotten War, or The War of 1812, A Neglected Conflict or the War of 1812, not as boring as you might think. Uh, in bookstores, people try to race past the books about the War of 1812 to get the good stuff with better names like the American Revolution or the Civil War. I tried to fool some of them by entitling one of my books, The Civil War of 1812. That led to a lot of returns. Uh, and so, besides the name, though, I think there are some substantial problems with this war, and that's that we tend to pinch it. Um, I'm, I'm going to take my mask off here. You are safe. I'm vaccinated. I'm a very long ways away from all of you. Um, we tend to pinch it between the formal declaration of war in June of 1812 and the Treaty of Ghent on Christmas Eve in 1814. And some popular historians even cast out the biggest battle of the war, the Battle of New Orleans in January of 1815, as if it was just some sort of silly communication problem and temporal anomaly. The 
narrow definition of the war views the conflict as framed by legal procedures, declaration of war and a treaty. In fact, very few American wars are so framed. So we're a little bit naive to say that the War of 1812 was the same way. I also think that there is a problem with geography. Classically, we narrate this war as a defensive conflict in which the Americans are beleaguered by the superior power of Britain. And so we focus on things like the burning of the Capitol and the White House by British forces that invaded in August of 1814. Or we remember, more happily, the battle at Baltimore, in which the bombardment of Fort McHenry by the British fleet failed to topple the American flag. Now, this is a problem for Canadians because they point out that most of the war, the United States was not on the defensive, but was on the offensive, and the Canadians were the target of this. Most of the conflict in the War of 1812 occurred between the territory of Michigan on the west and Montreal on the east, and it consisted of repeated American invasions that suffered repeated defeats as at the Battle of Queenston Heights, just below Niagara Falls, where American forces were swept off of the heights, many of them drowned in the river, and the rest of them surrendered. This does not loom large in American narratives of the war, but it looms large in Canada. And so they are telling their own version of a David versus Goliath in which Americans are Goliath and they are the David on the defensive. Now, in my experience, Canadians are remarkably polite and patient people on all topics except hockey in the War of 1812. <laughs> and my advice to you, if you have a Canadian friend, just take them aside and say you know that the United States invaded Canada and lost. If you do that, your Canadian friend will do anything for you. They'll mow your lawn, they'll wash your car. Now, what I want to argue is that the War of 1812 was much more than a war in Canada or a war to defend the United States, although it was both of those things. And I want to say that in terms of time, it's part of a conflict that began in 1810 and ran through 1819. So my argument is that we should be calling it the War of the 18-teens. It's a war in which we need to add in episodes that are usually abstracted out as something else. They include the American seizures of West Florida in two stages, in 1810 and 1813. The so-called Patriot War, in which um, filibusters from the United States invaded East Florida in 1812 to 1813. It includes the Battle of Tippecanoe, in which there's an effort to destroy a Native American confederacy led by this man, Tecumseh, that happens in 1811. It includes Andrew Jackson's two forays into Florida in 1814 and 1818, and then the destruction of something called the Negro Fort in Florida in 1816. I want to argue that all of these episodes had in common an effort by the United States to disrupt Native American alliances with other European powers principally with Britain and secondarily with Spain. Americans believed, and here is a cartoon that shows that belief, that it is foreign meddling that lies behind Native American resistance to American expansion. And so in all of these episodes, including the War of 1812, which is the biggest chunk of these episodes, in all of them, the American effort 
is to try to break up these alliances with native peoples in the conviction that it is only those alliances which are blocking American expansion by providing native peoples with munitions and with the encouragement to resist. Now, in this larger telling, I would argue that we need to give equal place to Florida along with Canada. Florida is a Spanish colony, but Spain was a very weak ally of the British Empire in 1812. Spain had been invaded by Napoleon. Most of Spain was under French military occupation. There is a guerrilla movement in Spain, and then there is a junta that is resisting French occupation and the rule of Napoleon's brother in Spain. And that junta is allied with Britain. It means, however, that the Spanish colonies in the Americas are under British domination, economic, political, and military domination. And, and Florida then is perceived, particularly by Southern Americans, as a place that is really under British control and is a threat of supplying munitions to native peoples along the southern frontier, and especially a threat to provide a haven for enslaved people escaping by from slavery by fleeing to ostensibly Spanish Florida. The man who most powerfully believes in this is Andrew Jackson, who in 1812 is a major general of the Tennessee militia. And he wrote in 1812, just as the war was beginning, and he wrote to the governor of Louisiana, quote, I hope the government will per permit us to traverse the southern coast and aid in planting the American eagles on the ramparts of Mobile, Pensacola, in St. Augustine. British influence must be destroyed or we will have the whole southern tribe of Indians to fight and slave insurrections to quell in all the southern states. So the, the, the belief was that if enslaved people have a relatively free path to escape and to form communities of runaways known as Maroons, that these havens will encourage more people to run away, and that these maroon communities will send out raiders who will attack farms and plantations in places like Georgia and Tennessee. And the belief was that if this phenomena keeps growing, it would snowball into a slave revolt that would destroy all of Southern society. Now, Andrew Jackson, Great opportunity comes in 1813 when there is a civil war among the Muscogee people or Creeks of what is now Alabama. And the great opening episode in this conflict is one in which Creek peoples who are hostile to American influence, people known as the Red Sticks, overwhelm an American fort in which some of their Creek enemies had holed up and it leads to great violence and loss of life, including civilians. This then mobilizes the forces of the United States in the Southwest under the leadership of Jackson, who will trap the Red Sticks at a place known to the Americans as Horseshoe Bend, but known to the Creeks as Toopeka. And it is the greatest loss of native life in one battle uh, in American history. It's estimated that about 2,000 Native people would be killed, most of them women and children. Now, Jackson would then go on after this victory at Toho Pico, which happens in March of 1814, and he would go to New Orleans, where he wages his most famous battle, one of the great one-sided battles in American history, in which almost all of the casualties are on the British side. And this is a battle that fits very well into American mythology because the British do what we always want them to do, which is to wear red uniforms, clump out in the open, 
and charge across an open field at entrenched American forces. They very rarely did this, but they did it just often enough to make it into American history books. Now, unfortunately for Jackson, this battle has generated a lot of mythology. And one of them is that the battle was fought after the war was over, which is not true. It was fought after the Treaty of Ghent was negotiated, but that treaty had not been ratified. And a war does not end until a treaty is ratified. And the United States Senate and President did not ratify the Treaty of Ghent until February of 1815, a month after the Battle of New Orleans. More importantly for me tonight is the war is in the middle of the War of the 18-teens rather than at the end of the War of 1812. And this war this battle, excuse me, because it is so one-sided, has an enormous and lingering impact upon both Americans and the British. It means that the British become phobic about ever again invading the United States. In their war planning for a potential war with Americans, which recurrently is a possibility during the 1830s and 40s, they are insisting that they will only fight the war on the high seas or in attacks on American seaports, but will never again try to get into the interior. And this battle makes Americans much more confident after the defeats they had suffered in the invasion of Canada. And the key to it all, I would argue, is the Treaty of Ghent. Now, if you thought the War of 1812 was boring, now we come to the Treaty of Ghent, which was written by lawyers and not novelists. No one should read the Treaty of Ghent and operate heavy machinery. But don't be fooled by its language into thinking that this is some sort of definitive contract that bound both parties to its literal terms. In fact, like any treaty, its meaning became what the parties made of it afterwards. And to be blunt, the true ultimate meaning of the Treaty of Ghent became what Americans could get away with and what the British could live with. It's during the five years after the Treaty of Ghent that Americans win the War of the 1810s by putting their own spin on this treaty. Well, let me start with this man, Henry Goulburn. Henry Goulburn was a British negotiator at the Treaty of Ghent. And he remarked, quote, I had till I came here no idea of the fixed determination which prevails in the breast of every American to extirpate the Indians and appropriate their territory." End quote. The British negotiating position at the start of the treaty was that they wanted to redo the American boundary with Canada by reserving much of Michigan and Wisconsin to be a buffer zone that would remain in the possession of native peoples in which the United States could not send in settlers and could not negotiate land sessions, and that this buffer zone would be under the protection of the British. Now, the British have reason to push this because they'd allied with Native peoples. Native peoples had helped them uh, to dominate that particular region. The British were still in occupation of northern Michigan and what is now Wisconsin. So the British thought this was reasonable that they weren't keeping it for themselves, they were just protecting it for their Indian allies. But the Americans made it quite clear, the negotiators, that they would accept no treaty that included a buffer zone for native peoples. And so the SOP that's put into the treaty is something called Article 9. And what Article 9 does, it says that the United States is to allow native peoples to come back if they've been driven from their homelands into all of the lands that they had possessed in 1811. And the Americans go along with this because they know 
that they can allow them to come back. They can say, look, we haven't taken any land from you, but then they can renew the process of treaties of dispossession. And that process begins right away. American negotiators that include this man, Lewis Cass, uh, would meet with native peoples uh, around the Great Lakes and they wouldn't seek land sessions right away, but they would oblige them to accept certain controversial treaties that had been made before the war that they had never accepted before the war, which involved massive land sessions in what is now Ohio in Indiana and in Michigan. But the greatest violation of Article 9 came uh, to the South. And it involved Andrew Jackson. Because Andrew Jackson was a force of his own. He was the most popular person in the United States and not someone that the American political leadership, including President Madison, wanted to tangle with. And what he had done in concluding the Creek War was to compel the Creeks to enter a treaty of Fort Jackson. And the reddish area on this map indicates what the Creeks ceded. Now part of it seems quite understandable, and that's that strip of land right in the heart of Alabama, which is extremely fertile territory. But what's odd is this long sweep that goes along the northern fringe of Florida. And the goal of that is not simply to gain land for more plantations and farms, but it's to create a distance between what remains of the Creek homeland and Florida, which was understood to be a British and Spanish haven. It's meant, in effect, to confine native peoples so that the process of American domination can proceed without foreign interference. But if you look at the Treaty of Fort Jackson, it, the language is quite explicit in there in Article 3, the United States demand that the Creek Nation abandon all communication and cease to hold any intercourse with any British or Spanish post, garrison, or town, and that they shall not admit among them any agent or trader who shall not derive authority from the president or authorized agent of the United States. And yet, so this would seem to be a very clear case that if you're going to follow Article 9, you've got to give up that land session and restore those lands to the Creeks because they were lands in Creek possession in 1811. But Jackson argues, uh, in a masterful, clever way, that the Creek War had nothing to do with the War of 1812 against the British. He insisted it was something different. So here we see the original example of disaggregating these episodes, which should be all lumped together. And Jackson is doing this disaggregation so he can say, Article 9 does not apply. We don't have to restore the Creeks to their lands and the Madison administration went along with this. They're also not about to evict thousands of American settlers who had moved into this session. From just 9,000 American citizens in 1810, Alabama's settler population had surged to 144,000 by 1820. Now, in both the Northwest and in the Southwest, Native peoples appealed to the British, said, we are still in alliance with you, and we want you to intervene against the Americans who are violating the Treaty of Ghent. The British thought leadership, political leadership, um, was under some pressure from their own subordinate officers in the colonies to, to honor their treaties with Native peoples. But the Imperial government in London decided that it could not afford financially renewed war. It especially could not afford a new disruption in their major foreign market, which was the United States, for British manufactured goods. And so on both of these occasions, the British backed down and did not send 
troops to renew war in North America. Now, a sympathetic Royal Marine officer, this man, Major Edward Nichols, had turned his fort at Apalachicola in northern Florida over to armed Maroons, rather than to the Spanish authorities, as he had been ordered to do by his government at the end of the War of 1812. On a bluff beside the river, about 15 miles above the mouth, the powerful fort mounted eight cannon and one howitzer, and the Maroons continued to fly the Union Jack. Southern Americans denounced this place as the Negro Fort. And you can see that at the top of this picture, at the bottom is an American fort that was later built. To the north of it, as indicated on this map, above at the top of the map, I should say, it's not really north, is you can see the outline of what was called the Negro Fort. And in August 27, 1816, American gunboats ascended the river and opened fire. One cannon shot penetrated the main powder magazine, which erupted in a massive explosion, destroying the fort and killing most of the defenders. Some survivors escaped deeper into Florida to join Seminole Indians who continued to resist American expansion. Others escaped to the Bahamas, a British colony, where they founded a community called Nicholstown. Now in 1818, Jackson followed up by invading Florida to attack the Seminoles. And in doing so, he captured two British subjects, Alexander Arbuthnot and Robert Armbruster, and had both of them executed. Now this would seem to be the kind of provocation that could bring on a new war with Britain. And might, because Jackson's invasion of Florida was not authorized by the Monroe administration, it's now the presidency of James Monroe in 1818, and there were some cabinet officers who wanted to discipline Jackson, Monroe refused to do so. And this is because Jackson had won even more popularity in a nation that especially hated the British for aiding Indians and runaway slaves. Fortunately for the United States, the British government did nothing but protest the executions, once again balking at a renewed war, once again showing the influence of the memory of the Battle of New Orleans on British policy in America. And the Spanish recognized that they could not defend Florida. So in February of 1819, they concluded a treaty in which they sold Florida to the United States. So now to conclude. In bending the Treaty of Ghent to serve American expansion, the United States pursued contrasting northern and southern definitions of their national boundaries. Defeats in Canada had sobered American leaders, which set northern limits to their future expansion. Unable to conquer Canada, Americans accepted their northern border. Never again would American forces invade. Instead, what they did was they hardened the border by building additional forts along the border, by blocking native peoples from going across the border to visit with the British, and by banning British traders from visiting native peoples within the American boundary, which was a unilateral abrogation of one of the features of the Jay Treaty of 1794. But while seeking this harder border to the north, which accepted the persistence of British Canada, while doing that, the United States vigorously erased its southern border with Spain, which was far the weaker of the powers. Where the northern invasions had reaped defeats revealing British and Canadian strength, the Americans' southern forays had won victories, including at New Orleans. And they had exposed the British and the Spanish as incapable of defending Florida and their native allies. During the years after the Treaty of Ghent, Americans exploited that weakness to create a lawless borderland that invited their further invasions. Then American diplomats exploited the weakness and the lawlessness to pressure the Spanish into ceding Florida to the United States. And then the British also accepted that 
acquisition by the United States. And this then had powerful consequences for future American expansion. It puts a southwestern tilt onto that expansion, which is different from what people had expected in 1812 when they thought that the conquest of Canada would be an easy process. Instead, American expansion is shunted more south and west, initially against Spain, initially against Florida, but subsequently against Texas, and ultimately against Mexico, which would succeed Spain as the principal neighbor of the United States to the south and the west. And it is that tilt, you can see all of this territory to the south and west, that would be exposed to the Americans' war with Mexico in the 1840s. It is that tilt that would ultimately divide Americans and lead to a civil war over the future of the lands that Americans had taken to the south and west rather than to the north. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. So, so go ahead. ahead. Yeah, so um, if, do you think if the Treaty of Ghent had succeeded in making that buffer zone um, between Canada and the U.S. that would have been held by uh, Native Americans, how long do you think it would have taken before the U.S. violated that area? 30, 30 minutes. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you had a question? First of all, thanks so much for a really interesting talk. Uh, your, your conclusion seems to invite a counterfactual question. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to ask it. Uh, see, imagine the American invasion of Canada had been successful and we did end up yeah. with this northern tilt. I'm just kind of curious, what, could you talk a little bit about the broad mm -hmm. trajectory? Uh, this was very much a fear. There was a, there's an irony that in the War of 1812, the most enthusiastic supporters for it are Southern and Western, rather than Northeastern. But they also noted, the one thing that gives them pause, these Southern and Western supporters, especially the Southern but Western supporters are just fine. They want to expand in every possible direction. The, the southern things, well, but do we really want to add all of that territory to the north? We often, I think, have a misunderstanding of what the United States was before the Civil War. It was a much looser confederation than, than really a consolidated nation. And congressmen were always worried that if they expanded in one direction at the ex rather than another, that it would strengthen one region of the country and give it greater power within the Union. So Southern congressmen are saying, are we, do we really want to add Canada to the Union? Because then we'll have a lot of French people and we'll also have strengthened the North because this is not territory for slaves. Um, they kind of got around that by saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to conquer it, uh, and then we'll use it as a bargaining chip, and we'll get the concessions on navigation issues that we really want. Okay, problem with that, the Westerners really want to conquer Canada. Other problem is they're also counting on the Canadians to welcome American invaders, and why would you welcome an invasion where the people have announced we're just coming temporarily to occupy you and then we're going to withdraw? This is a phenomenon we're all too familiar with from our recent experience. It's hard to motivate people to support you if you have a track record of going in and then 
pulling out. So, but this is how they held this coalition together. And one of the things that the Madison administration says to Southerners, don't worry, we grabbed a bunch of West Florida in 1810, and we're going to use this War of 1812. They didn't call it the War of 1812. Then. We're going to use this war against Britain to disrupt Florida and bring it into the United States as a counterweight to adding Canada. So that's kind of the understood deal. It's n not something that people talk much openly about. It's behind scenes kind of understanding. But what happens when the United States is not successful in Canada, but instead is successful in Florida? So the argument of my presentation tonight is that's exactly what happened. And so Southerners who had been worried about a northern tilt instead get the southern tilt that is more than they could have dreamed of. Now, you ask for a counterfactual, though. What happens if it comes in? I think it would have created a crisis in the Union because um, much more quickly than 1819 would there become an issue about what are the rules for Western expansion and are we going to encourage expansion by the slave system into additional territories? And the North would have been in a stronger position for that argument than they were in 1819 to 20 when there had to be a compromise. So I hesitate to carry the counterfactual further than that, but I'm thinking that the crisis of the United States and its union would have come in 1819 to 1820 if there had been this northern expansion rather than the southern expansion during the 18-teens. Yep. Yes. Yes, Michael. Hi again, Professor Taylor. I was just wondering if we could place this within the context of one of the main arguments of your book, because I believe you emphasize that this was also a time, instead of manifest destiny and certainty within the United States, it was also a time of fracture and uncertainty. Right. I think you hinted at it in the previous question, but viewing the United States in this alliance, how does that make us rethink just U.S. imperialism in general? Right. Well, uh, I have uh, argued that the best thing we could do in writing American history before the 1840s is to never use the phrase manifest destiny. I have students that, that think it's, you put it in every exam. If you want to understand you know, why do the pilgrims come to Plymouth, it's manifest destiny. Um, the problem, there are many problems with manifest destiny. One of them suggests that nothing can stop it. And in, you know, in hindsight, that's tempting. We know how the story unfolds. We know the United States comes to dominate the North American continent and native peoples are crushed and confined within reservations. We know that. Um, but that's not how history works in the process. There were so many things that could have gone awry. And in fact, when we see what's motivating American leaders prior to the 1840s, is not this kind of confidence, we've got this manifest destiny. The phrase didn't even exist until the middle of the 1840s. Uh, nobody even has the concept, or they sometimes talk about, yeah, we, we're going to expand in all of this, but what's even more common is to say we're threatened. We're threatened by the British, the Spanish, all these Indian people's slave revolts, and if all of these come together in the perfect storm, it'll destroy our union. Or they would say, our union will get unbalanced if we expand in one direction too much to the north or too much to the south, and then we'll have a civil war within the United States, which was the whole purpose of the United States to avoid, was to keep states from fighting wars with each other. So I'm saying, let's just linger over the insecurity of Americans during the early 19th century, and then we'll have a better understanding of what they did. And manifest destiny works against that. 
Oh, thank you, Claire. Question for you is when does the War of 1812 become the War of 1812? It's a good question. I think it becomes known as the War of 1812 when the United States goes to war with Mexico. Um, before then, it was just called, you know, sometimes the Second War for American Independence or the Late American War, the Late War with Britain is a phrase that's often used. But as it starts to recede in time, um, then it becomes the War of 1812. Yes. Thank you for the talk. So earlier you mentioned a the British diplomat saying that he was uh, astounded at like the single-minded determination of Americans to like extirpate uh, native tribes and like how sort of widespread was this in American society? This idea that like the the native tribes have to go because you mentioned they felt threatened, but what, that Americans felt threatened. But was this like were there regions that believed this more strongly than others? Were there yeah. Yeah. Well, Henry Goldburn is relying primarily on his conversations with Henry Clay. And Henry Clay, who is one of the American negotiators there, he's from Kentucky, and he's quite keen that Native peoples have no place in the future of North America. And if, if they're all dead, that's fine with Henry Clay. He says so. Um, you know, other Americans weren't quite so sure of that. And so I would say there are kind of two strands of thoughts. One, one is the one that we associate with Thomas Jefferson uh, and many American missionary organizations, which is that Native people's culture must die. Uh, but, if, but Native peoples are perfectly capable of being assimilated and becoming American citizens. They just have to give up their tribal identities and their traditional cultures. And if they do that, fine. And indeed, these Americans say that an Indian person is perfectly capable of learning American culture, and they should be incorporated into the United States as equals, but as individual citizens, not as members of Indian nations with traditional cultures. That's got to go. That's the more liberal of the positions. And then there's the Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson position, which is Indians are doomed. Um, we're, we're just kind of facilitating their destruction. They're going to destroy them themselves is kind of the notion. Uh, but we just have to break up these alliances with the, with the British and the Spanish, and then Native peoples won't be able to resist us. And then we'll just push them westward, and then they will fight each other over buffaloes, and um, eventually they'll drink themselves to death. That's literally what these American leaders of that particular variety thought. All right. Thank you, Philip. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the great talk tonight. I've enjoyed it. I was, um, you discussed the uh, implications of Jackson's popularity in the United States and how um, partly because of that, the United States presidency was a little bit hesitant to go against him. Right. And I was, this is kind of a two part question. One, to what degree was that agreeing with Jackson? To what degree was that public pressure? And then if it, they had disregarded that public pressure and kind of stood against Jackson, what would the ramifications have been for not only them but for the United States? Well, the immediate ramifications is Monroe's cabinet. Uh, Monroe wants to run for re-election in 1820. And then every member of his cabinet wants to succeed Monroe as president. So everybody is thinking, how is this going to help me become president? If I try to confront Andrew Jackson and denounce him for attacking Indians and killing a couple of British guys, that's not going to help me get reelected as president in 1820. And it's certainly not going to help John Quincy Adams or William Crawford in their presidential bid. So they're going, I don't think tangling with Andrew Jackson is a winner for any of us here. The one guy who kind of initially is calculating maybe it would help him is John C. Calhoun, because he's from South Carolina, and he's thinking there's only so much air in this room for two presidential candidates from the South. Um, maybe this will actually bring Jackson down. Uh, Jackson will find out about this years later, after he's put Calhoun on his, as his running mate, and Calhoun becomes his vice president. And then 
Martin Van Buren ferrets out the dirt that, that in this cabinet meeting, Calhoun had actually tried to get Monroe to, um, to fire Jackson. Uh, and uh, you, you don't want Andrew Jackson to hate you. If any of you are in time travelers and you go back there, your primary goal is don't have Andrew Jackson hate you because it gets you killed. Now, Calhoun is lucky that, that Jackson had become old enough that he was beyond dueling with people or brawling with them. Uh, but Calhoun was literally, well, not, was figuratively dead to Jackson after that. And Calhoun never became president. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, Professor. Hi. Thank you again for just giving this talk. I really appreciated it. Well, thank you. This is such a wonderful audience. Everybody has thanked me. This is. I just want to give talks here from now on. Perfect. So my question has to do with just the title of War of 1812. I feel like. We often stereotype it, as you said earlier, as just the second war for independence. Right. And obviously, in your talk, you talked a lot about how there's this broader context. You have the issue of Native Americans and slaves, and as well as the European powers and presence in America. And so I was just wondering how we can address this so people don't just you know, pass by the event as just a second um, war for independence with Britain and how we can get people to assign greater context and importance to the event. Uh, mostly by reading my books. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it, it's, it's a very good question. And I, you know, this, this is, you, we could ask similar questions about all sorts of things. Um, I'll often uh, give presentations and I'll have uh, people say, I never learned any of this stuff in school. Why aren't they teaching this in the schools? Well, some of this is being taught in schools now, but uh, teaching in school is a very difficult job. It, it's becoming more and more difficult. Um, and there's a lot to cover. So I, I wish every American could have a good understanding of the War of 1812. But there's a long list of things that I wish Americans could have a good understanding of in their past. And we all just have to keep trying in our own ways to keep educating ourselves as citizens and helping the people we know to think about these issues. But it, it's, not, it's not gonna be simple and it's not gonna be fast. People have been complaining about what, how little Americans know about their history ever since 1776. Well, that's actually true. I mean, John Adams was beside himself. He says, nobody's gonna write the true history of the American Revolution. They're all gonna say that Benjamin Franklin struck George Washington with his electrical rod and electrified him, and then together the two of them conducted all of the battles and all of statecraft of the Revolution. Our story of the revolution will be one continued lie from beginning to end. That's John Adams saying that. Um, so th this, this is going to be perpetual. That doesn't mean that we don't all do whatever we can. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a parrot, thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> Um, I just was hoping that you could elaborate a little bit on sort of the effects of that confidence that was gained by the South um, after Jackson's success and sort of the legacy that would have carried on leading into the Civil War. Yeah. There is a, a there, there was a fair amount of trepidation by the American leaders when they declared war on Britain in 1812. Britain's a major power. The United States was not a major power. British had 1,000 warships. The United States had about 24. Now, those 24 warships did pretty well, but they're not going to change the strategic situation. And British forces, the, the British army is also no slouch, and as they were showing in Spain at that time, fighting Napoleon's divisions. Uh, so there is a lot of concern. Now, they took heart from the fact that Britain was busy in Spain fighting Napoleon um, at, in 1812, 
they didn't know was that Napoleon was going to destroy himself in Russia later that year, which makes it possible for the British to then invade the United States in 1814 at Washington and Baltimore and Plattsburgh and New Orleans. So when the Battle of New Orleans happens, and it's so one-sided, and it comes at the same time that news of the Treaty of Ghent reaches Washington, D.C., it's almost literally the same day, it has a psychological impact uh, that's almost overnight among a majority of American political leaders, and I think safe to say among a majority of Americans thinking about politics, which is we can beat anybody. And the line that we beat the veterans who beat Napoleon is repeated over and over again in books and pamphlets and newspapers. And that's because of the Battle of New Orleans and to a lesser extent, Baltimore and Plattsburgh. So I do think that it generates a strand of American nationalism and of national confidence, which is not universal, but is pretty widespread, that wasn't there before. And the Battle of New Orleans is the number one contributor to that. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you for your talk. <laughs> I, I actually really like it that people thank me for the talk, so it's OK. So uh, Britain obviously had its own agenda in this war. Um, uh -huh. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what their specific motivations and objectives were, um, and then also how it might have changed the course of subsequent American history if they succeeded. OK, very good question, as all the questions have been. Um, Britain's goal initially was not to have a war because fighting the Americans is not something they wanted. They're busy with Napoleon. Um, the scale of the War of 1812 is paltry compared to, to the Napoleonic Wars. We're talking about battles in which you have 300,000 men on the two sides. There's nothing like that in the War of 1812. These are battles with three or 4,000 on each side. Uh, fighting Napoleon is a full-time job. And Napoleon had, had basically conquered almost all of Europe until he really overplays his hand in Russia in 1812. So Britain initially is just trying to say to the Americans, look, you guys, we're, Britain is doing the world's good deeds here by fighting Napoleon, who is in a, he's a despot. And the, the, the British concept of freedom is they're liberators if they can defeat Napoleon and liberate Europe, even though the liberation is going to be back under their old monarchs. So Britain initially is, is hoping, look, there's just some kind of misunderstanding. They think that they can negotiate a quick understanding with the Americans. They gave up in June of 1812 some of the uh, maritime practices that had provoked the war. But the one thing that the Britain won't do is give up what they claim is their right to impress sailors who are British subjects, which they define very broadly. And that means from neutral vessels, including the vessels of the United States. So that's what the war boils down to by the end of June of 1812, plus the whole Indian business in the West. Now, Britain's goals after that, it becomes clear that the Americans aren't going to be settled with the revocation of the, of the orders in council, which had allowed British warships to stop American merchant ships to confiscate cargoes and ships trading with Napoleon's Europe. Once that's not going to solve the war, the British goal is mess with the Americans. Punish them. Because they regarded this war as a sucker punch. So their goal is to disrupt the American economy as much as they can by disrupting maritime trade, afflicting coastal places, particularly around Chesapeake Bay. Um, encourage enslaved people to run away because this will disrupt the economy. 
uh, enlist them into British forces as colonial marines, which is what Edward Nichols was doing down in Florida. Um, and that will create pressure. And then if you grab New Orleans, that's the choke point because goods move by water in the 18-teens. They don't move over land very well, not economically. So if you control New Orleans, you control the entire interior of the continent for anybody who wants to be engaged in, in selling farm produce or lumber or anything. So they thought they'd be in the position to kind of negotiate a, a further disruption of the American Union and also New England was, being, was becoming disaffected and some New England political leaders were in covert negotiations with British leaders in Nova Scotia about maybe we can reach an understanding if we do secede from the United States. So the the British government's a complex group. There isn't one kind of policy, but there are a variety of policy makers who have different goals. The primary goal is still, if we can end this war as soon as possible, we're gonna do it. If we can't end it as soon as we possible, if we can mess up the American Union and discredit republicanism, that will make the British system of government safer in the world. And that's what New Orleans was, was supposed to do, it was supposed to serve the agenda of the more hardliners in the British government. Thank you. Yep. I, I've always thought uh, General Matthew Ridgway's evaluation of post-World War II American military history was very apt. He said we went into Korea with a pretty bad army and came out with a pretty good one, and we went into Vietnam with a pretty good army and came out with a pretty bad one. How would we comparably evaluate American military development in the War of 1812? That's also a good question. Um, the United States went into the War of 1812 with about the worst army you could imagine. Um, a fair number of political leaders suffered from the delusion that you could just send militia to do a lot of the fighting. Well, who were the militia? The militia is basically every able-bodied, free, white person between the ages of 16 and 45. In other words, farmers, clerks, blacksmiths. They, their training consists of one training day a year. Um, and that training consists mostly of time spent in a local tavern. They mostly don't have working firearms. Uh, and when you suggest to them that wouldn't they like to invade Canada and fight the Indians there, they mostly decide they'd rather not and that the Constitution doesn't oblige them to do so. There was an American regular army. The regular army's authorized strength at the start of the War of 1812, I believe, was 10,000 men. Now, 10,000 men, if you put them all in one place, would be a significant army, but they can't all be in one place because the United States has an enormous security perimeter. And it's not just by land. If you're fighting the British Empire, you're fighting the number one naval power in the world, and you better have some way to defend New York City and Boston and Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and New Orleans at the same time that you're invading Canada. So it meant that the number of American regulars going in, you know, three or 4,000 supplemented by militiamen. Also, the American regulars were mostly newly recruited because the Americans authorized strength of this army had only very recently grown from about 4,000 men. And they had nothing like basic training. So can you imagine sending guys who are fresh from the farm, you give them some guns, you teach them how to, to load and fire the weapon, and that there is a thing called the bayonet that they ought to use in close quarters. And by the way, the British are really good at using these bayonets. Uh, now we're taking you into combat. And that's literally all the training they had until 1814. Uh, it was up, there, 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 there is no, Paris Island, There's, there is no training facility 
what would happen is these raw recruits would come into an army encampment, let's say up in Buffalo, uh, and it was up to individual officers, and individual officers had different training manuals that they used. So it was then very hard to coordinate American military forces in combat because they're doing different things in, in different units. The one guy who really is really good at training his men is Winfield Scott who is the second in command on the Niagara front in the 1814 campaign. And it was noticeable that those troops uh, in, in his brigade um, behaved like veterans. And they, they did stand up to, to the best troops that the British had in Canada in uh, European style combat, open fields. Um, but the consequences is enormous casualties. So on the one hand, Scott prepares a brigade that fights as well or better than the British, but then in the course of combat virtually destroys it. Um, now, they destroyed a lot of British forces too, um, but ultimately the campaign in Niagara in 1814 is inconsequential strategically because the United States is left in no stronger position after this campaign. And Niagara's the wrong place to fight this campaign if you want to win the war in Canada. The right place is Montreal. Um, but they're not fighting there because they thought it would be too hard. And there were other political pressures that are pushing them off to Niagara. So at the end of the war, Scott establishes um, certain precedents for training American forces. And Scott will become the, the, the leading American general on until 1861, when he is the, the principal general in the United States Army when the Civil War begins. And he's the principal leader in the invasion of Mexico. And he's a superb general. And he is a great, um, great at training men. And some of his principles then become key to subsequent discipline of the American army, of the regulars. And uh, it also included the, the use of gray uniforms at West Point, which goes back to, to the precedent that Scott had established because he was able to get his hands on gray uniforms rather than the usual blue uniforms in 1814. Okay, any other questions? One more. Again, if you don't mind. Um, so, how do you think that the military engagements and naval developments that the United States made during the Barbary Wars influenced the War of 1812? Uh, it influences uh, naval practice. Now, it's, it's a different adversary. The United States had naval um, advantage uh, in the deeper waters of the Mediterranean. Its, its problem in the Barbary Wars was that it, it um, initially was overmatched in the shallower waters of, of Tripoli Harbor. It's kind of the reverse, in the, it's greatly the reverse in the, in the War of 1812, where generally, you know, the American um, naval forces are a bit better in shallower waters or in one-on-one -on -one ship battles between frigates, because American frigates, like the USS Constitution, AKA Old Ironsides, is a better designed ship than anything the British had. So in one-to-one -one ship battles, uh, the United States does very well. But the, the naval captains of the War of 1812 for the United States uh, cut their teeth in Tripoli. And they were often called Preble's boys. Preble, Edward Preble was the commander of the American um, naval expedition against Tripoli. And he's dead by the War of 1812. But people like Bainbridge and Isaac Hull, they were all lieutenants, or Decatur, they were all lieutenants. Um, Decatur becomes a captain uh, during the Tripoli War, but they will be the captains and the commodores of the War of 1812. And from Preble and that particular naval operation, they learn how you command a ship, and they learn how you can coordinate ship activity. And it bred a confidence in them one of the problems that the French and the Spanish had is that they kept losing naval battles, and so there isn't an, an esprit that you can actually win. What the Americans develop at Tripoli is the notion that you can win 
<laughs> naval combat, that we have good ships, we have good sailors, we have good officers. And, and that will come into play in the War of 1812, where the Navy performs well, but within these certain limited parameters that the very small numbers of warships allows the United States when they are fighting a power as great as Great Britain. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>